Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, nice to see such a good turnout. Uh, my name's Ross Forbes, and I've got the honour of working for the Durham Miners Association, um, whose building this is. How many of you have been here before? Oh, yeah, that's a good 2%, right? Um, for those of you who haven't, uh, I'd just like to do a little introduction to the building. I'll have to do the, um, the housekeeping first. As you can see where the fire exits are, just follow the signs. Uh, the ladies, is, if you haven't found it yet, is just behind the doors here, and the gents are down the corridor. Um, any other housekeeping matters, uh, I'll be around if you want to ask. About this building itself, is, um, it's the second miners' hall. The first one is in North Road in Durham, opened in 1880. By the time this was opened in 1915, there were 188 collieries in County Durham alone. And that's you know, um, probably employing in the region of half a million people, um, either directly in the coal mine or not. Each one of these seats you're sitting in has a number on the back of it, and that number correlates to the colliery delegate who would come in here to discuss matters of the day, normally money, uh, health and safety, but uh, they also, through their own collective endeavours, built libraries, community hospitals, aged miners' homes. They built a welfare state from here before it was even, even considered um, to come into parliamentary statute. It's a very important building. It's full of the ghosts of Pittman in many ways. So we're really, really pleased tonight, being this is the home of the people who really carried through the second industrial revolution, to host Common Room, the Mining Institute, if you like, um, here for, you're on the road now, I believe, and um, please all have a very good evening, and thank you very much for coming. Thanks very much, Ross, much, Ross and for having us. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Liz Mays. I'm the Chief Executive of the Common Room, and tonight I will be chairing this discussion. Um, this is the first panel discussion that we've run as the Common Room, and there may well be many of you who don't know what Common Room is. Um, the Common Room is a new charity. It was set up to take over the assets of the Mining Institute in central Newcastle um, to give it a sustainable future and to um, redevelop a new vision for it. Um, doing events like this is one of the things that we want to do to once again provide a forum for discussion about the future of the Northeast region. Um, and it seems very appropriate that tonight for our first such panel event, we are doing it in uh, Red Hills, whose heritage is absolutely intertwined with ours, and particularly that we are discussing the future of work in a place um, that was at the forefront of establishing workers' rights during the first, industrial, first and second industrial revolution, and um, that played such an important part in supporting communities uh, through the deindustrialization that happened in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, but tonight isn't about talking about the past. There are certainly lessons to be learned from um, what happened through those transitional changes um, in industry. Um, but what we're focusing on today is the fourth industrial revolution, which we are really at the beginning of, um, and which has the potential to make exponential changes to methods of production, ways of working, and, um, and the, the environment that all of us live and work in. And so what we'll hear tonight is a variety of perspectives from our four esteemed panellists on this um, and, and get, their, get their views on that. In terms of format, um, each of the panellists is going to um, come up to the lectern, uh, tell you a bit about who they are and wh what um, their perspective is on this issue, um, and then we'll open it up for questions. We are hoping to have you away by quarter to eight. I'm going to keep my phone here for timekeeping. Um, so without further ado, I will um, I'll tell you who our panellists are. So we have Chris McDonald, who is the Chief Exec of the Materials Processing Institute, um, Beth Farhat, the Regional Secretary for the TUC, Gerald Moore, who is Philosopher of Technology for Durham University, and Alison Reynolds, who is a Strategic HR Consultant with significant experience of manufacturing and engineering sector. So without further ado, I will hand over to you, Chris, to begin. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. So for me personally, it is a real honour and a privilege to speak here in the Pitman's Parliament, uh, a building that's been rightly recognised of national importance by Historic England recently. I was born and brought up in the communities 
that are represented here in this room. And I feel an overwhelming surge of emotion every time I walk into here as I think about the ordinary working men, some of them members of my family, who sat here to improve the communities and directly influence the politics of the day. This is not, though, a place of the past. What excites me is the renewed potential of this building to provide education, nurture our culture, and act as a focus for binding our communities together, just as this Pitman's Parliament was built brick by brick by the pennies and halfpennies of working miners organising themselves in response to the impact of the first industrial revolution. So our communities need an institution like this, which will protect, support and enable them to adapt to the transformational impact of the fourth industrial revolution. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with the first industrial revolution. Founded in Britain on coal and steam, it was accompanied by a surge of invention. The second and third industrial revolution saw the introduction of electrification and automation. But just as the first industrial revolution replaced muscle with machine, so the fourth industrial revolution seeks to replace minds with machine learning. We can all conjure images of that first industrial revolution where Stevenson's rocket or the spinning jenny transformed Britain and the world but also led to the societal disruption of urban relocation and the smokestacks of Victorian England. So think about the change today and the work of a company like Boston Dynamics which has developed a robot to perform the basic human task of turning a door handle. It looks part dog, part boa constrictor, yet in a year the robots now work in packs and they use computer vision to leap across boxes. My approach to this shift from workers to algorithms is grounded in a sincerely held belief in the value of good work. Values I've inherited from the founders of this very hall. The importance of work in creating a sense of self-worth, of confidence, of purpose, the cohesive way in which work holds our families and societies together. I say this having experienced what it is like to live in a community where there is a lack of work, to live in a family where there is unemployment. This experience has brought home to me the destructive and depressive power of worklessness and a drive to ensure that as few people as possible will live through it. We must acknowledge that these new technologies bring risks, cause stress and are contributing to a crisis in mental health but we must embrace them and seek to benefit from their potential to decarbonise our environment and improve our lives and our society for the better. The fourth industrial revolution is revealing that there are fundamental flaws in our economic system. We need a new economic model. Relentless drive to maximise gross domestic product ignores well-being and increases inequality, something I first raised in a speech in 2017. What was then considered radical is now increasingly mainstream. The GDP is outdated and has the potential to be fully broken by these new technologies. Now, to understand why this, why this is the case, consider this. I play the cornet in the Durham Miners Association brass band. And I learned to play when I was nine, and my tutor at the time was employed by the local authority. My early lessons, stumbling and unmusical as they were, did at least contribute to GDP. This year, I'm learning to play the trombone using entirely free tuition from YouTube. Whilst adding greatly to my personal satisfaction, if not that of my family, this transaction is invisible to the economy. It does not contribute to GDP. Now, why is this important? If we take GDP as our primary measure of progress, we ignore the wider sharing economy, which is unquantified but valued by people. This is something well understood by the communities in County Durham, who have always and instinctively stepped in to support one another, whether as a result of individual misfortune through structured welfare programmes, as Ross described, or during times of industrial strife. Not only are our measures wrong, but so is our perception of what constitutes a modern economy. We have an industrial strategy for the first time in 40 years, and yet it's strange that we have no strategy for energy. More than this, our industrial strategy has a sector deal for the creative industries, but not for steel. In September, I met the Cabinet Secretary, Sir Mark Sedwell, when he visited my hometown of Horton Lisbury. 
We discussed the damaging legacy from the closure of the collieries and the deindustrialization of this region. He was right to highlight this, but his words, in his words, there was an assumption that deindustrialization was an inevitability when in fact it is a choice. It is a misconception uniquely held in the UK that economic progress turns from manufacturing to services to financial services, whilst every other nation in the world realises that wealth is built on a foundation of industry, and we know that this also builds community cohesion. We need not only to change the way that we measure progress in our economy, but to acknowledge where and how prosperity is created. In this high technology revolution, as in all previous technology revolutions, those nations and peoples that will prosper will be those that have a strong manufacturing base, supported by, not driven by, sophisticated services and financial services. As these new technologies have changed our economy, so the changes in economics are disrupting our society, with jobs in the Midlands and the North most at risk. Over two-thirds of the hardest-hit parliamentary constituencies are in these regions, but it's in Shadow Chancellor John Macdonald's constituency, which contains Heathrow Airport, that up to 40% of jobs are at risk from automation. Little wonder that he is more engaged than most politicians in this area. We can expect that if we pursue a similar course of non-intervention as we did with deindustrialization, then regional inequality will grow. Just as the robber barons of the late 19th and early 20th century managed to accumulate vast riches through their corporations, so the founders of Amazon, Facebook and the like are able to corral a significant proportion of national wealth but they are able to do this more quickly, with lower capital and with fewer employees than JP Morgan, Andrew Carnegie and the Rockefeller family could have imagined. Increasingly, the digital world enables mega corporations to be established and run by a very small number of people, concentrating wealth still further, driving an increasing gap between rich and poor and creating a more unequal society. This phenomenon is not new. It was also experienced in the first industrial revolution, only this time it is happening more quickly and it is reversing a trend of decades. The impact of these new technologies on productivity is also contributing to this inequality. In the past it was taken for granted that increased productivity resulted in increased wages, but this is no longer certain. The broad sweep of history tells us that the first industrial revolution raised living standards like never before. This is true. But for a generation or more who lived through it, it was a misery. Living standards fell before they rose. Infant mortality increased before it reduced. Housing became dangerous before it improved. Just last Saturday, I attended the memorial service for Thomas Hepburn, the founder of the first miners' union. One of Hepburn's achievements was to fight and win for a reduction in the working shift for boys under the age of 12, from 18 hours a day to 12 hours a day. We must not forget that the rights and privileges we enjoy today have been the result of a struggle at great personal cost to the individuals involved. Whilst the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution undoubtedly have the potential to bring long run improvements in all of our lives, we must not accept that there will be a period of lax regulation where gains can be exploited by a lucky few, whilst the struggle for equality and prosperity for the many begins anew. These challenges to our economy and society are leading to competing visions for the future of our country. We should not forget that the fascism which swept Europe in the 1930s was born at a time of the greatest income inequality and social change until the present day. Concerns over future capacity for employment have led to ideas such as the universal basic income and inequality has reignited the desire for greater employee involvement in companies whilst direct action is being taken on climate change. Set against this is the reality of insecure work and calls for greater deregulation. These new technologies do, though, enable people to work outside of existing economic clusters, meaning that decentralization, as well as democratization of industry and services, is now possible. One way we can both decentralize and democratize our economy is to adopt new models of ownership. In the past, societal forces drove the cooperative movement, and worker ownership is gaining popularity now even in private companies such as Richer Sounds, Ardman Animations, and even BT. But we need to go further. When setting up the Materials Processing Institute, I set aside commercial forms of ownership, 
to create a not-for-profit entity with no shareholders and a democratically elected employee director on the board. I, like everyone in the company, am an employee, and we work together to deliver a shared vision. In conclusion, then, the fourth industrial revolution has the potential to decarbonise our economy and to improve our lives, but there are competing visions for the future of our society, and we must fight to ensure that people are not forgotten, that we avoid rising inequality, and that we invest in our communities. We can do this by recognising that progress is about more than increasing GDP and that by decentralising and democratising our economy. We have a responsibility to do this to those like the Durham miners who have gone before us, those who worked hard to gain the rights that we now enjoy. But getting this right for me is also deeply personal. I have two small children and I can be sure that whatever jobs they will be doing in 20 years' time probably haven't even been thought of yet. But I want my children, and everyone's children, to have the opportunity through good work and secure employment for a fulfilling and purposeful life in a fair and equal society. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Beth Farhat, and I'm the Regional Secretary for the Northern TUC, uh, covering the North East in Cumbria. Uh, and as part of my job is representing 330,000 trade union members that we have across the North East in Cumbria. And I just really want to start by saying welcome to our Pitman's Parliament. Isn't it wonderful? I'm really proud every time I get an opportunity to speak here because my great grandfather was a Pitman, my grandfather was a Pitman, my husband, my father in law all worked down the mines across the northeast and I tell you what if one opened tomorrow they'd go back um, at best job they ever had so um, to be speaking in this hall uh, steep with so much heritage is absolutely great but actually buildings like this need you um, they need you to use them for functions they need you to use them to learn and if you're not a Mara if you've never been to the Durham Miners Gala I can't tell you how much you know, you've got to go and you've got to experience our heritage. And if you're not a Mara, become a Mara. Join and help us keep our heritage alive and actually get an application form on your way out. That would be absolutely brilliant. Not that I'm on the board of directors of the Durham Miners Gala mm -hmm. or anything, but it's, uh, I'm really passionate about the Durham Miners Gala <laughs> and keeping it alive. Um, but I'm here today to talk about the world of work, and that's very much changing, isn't it? And I think we've got big issues that require mature conversations about what the future of work is going to look like, but feel like for communities and workers, because we are transitioning when it comes to automation, climate change, moving towards a low carbon economy, and of course the impact of Brexit on employment rights and parity with the rest of Europe in an environment where already poor rights, we've got poor rights for insecure workers, you know, more and more people now are in insecure work, more and more people now are juggling two, three, four, five, zero hour contracts, you know, and they don't want that, they want to have stability and quality of life. But I want to focus my remarks today very much on, you know, the area where unions can make a huge difference, and that is managed automation. Um, a just and fair transition actually to the new machine age so that tech change isn't something that's done to workers but with them, alongside them, they're part of the process of transitioning. Um, so we minimise the risk of automation and digitalisation and, uh, and maximise the opportunities for people. So we share the gains fairly. Um, you know, there's no doubt that we are on the cusp of major change. The 2020s are said to be the age of profound technological disruption. And organisations like IPPR um, estimate that 44% of jobs are vulnerable through automation. Um, and we know that it's workers and places already battered by industrial change that of course are at the most risk. And at a time where working people are worried about the impact of Brexit on their jobs and livelihoods, the tech revolution for many people could actually make or break them. So from Victorian mills to Henry Ford's production lines, we've experienced upheavals before. Um, but the difference is this time is the speed and the scale of change that's happening across the country. So 
artificial intelligence, algorithms and automation are transforming the world of work. Offices, office jobs are vanishing into the cloud. Um, factories could soon be run by rob robots in the main. Um, and tomorrow's quantum computers will make today's supercomputers look like abacuses, to be honest. Um, but to state the obvious is that, you know, some jobs are going to go, some jobs will change, and workers are going to have to adapt. And we must make, um, you know, we have to be on our guard, actually, and Chris mentioned this, about, you know, the rise in inequality. Um, and, of the and of the rewards of automation, um, I think one of the things we are worried about is the rewards of automation flowing more to the owners of capital as profits rather than to workers in wages, but in flexible working as well. So one of the things we're worried about is, you know, a more polarised labour market, you know, with well-rewarded tech talent at the top, and that's great, but um, digital drudgery for everybody else in the middle and in the bottom. So in their different ways, we've already seen actually how organisations like Uber, Amazon and Deliveroo are using 21st century technology to deliver 18th century exploitation, normalising insecurity, avoiding basic employment rights and micromanaging workers. So we can choose an alternative path um, to a fairer digital future, a more equal, a more just one. Um, with the right approach, we can take tech, um, we can make tech change uh, for a, a force for good. Um, and I think actually we need to make sure that, you know, that we get lots of positives for working people. There's going to be lots of new jobs, we know that, not just in new manufacturing industries, but in rapidly um, evolving knowledge and in the information economy as well. Secondly, there's going to be higher productivity. Uh, that's not just good economically, um, but also if the gains are shared fairly, it's good news for workers in terms of pay, pensions, uh, reduction in working hours, more flexible working for families. Um, and thirdly, there's going to be advances in knowledge um, for the common good, which is great. So medicine, science, and learning will be kind of transformed, and our public services will become you know, more responsive, which is good. But how the tech re revolution plans out is all about choices that we make now and the engagement that we have. We've got to have the right voices around the table. So we've got nothing to fear if it's matched by a revolution in skills, for example, rights and social protections. If we address the needs of all workers, not just the high flyers, and um, if we actually have the collective courage to think big and bold about a fair transition. And remember, th there is plenty we can do a new partnership, a coalition between uh, business, unions, government to manage change is completely doable. Um, a new technology displacement fund is something that TC is talking about to support workers with retraining in those digital skills. Um, public works programs to provide new employment <laughs> for displaced workers. Uh, Personalised training budgets for all working people. And of course, more collective bargaining and new technology agreements between unions and employers, more learning agreements, more working together in partnership when it comes to workforce development and transition. And I mentioned it before, a commission on the future of work. So as the voice of working people in every part of the economy, trade unions of course have a key role to play, not just in shaping the digital economy for the future, but ensuring that actually it meets the needs um, of what the late great trade union leader Jack Jones memorably called the human face of labour. So get our approach right and we can make new technology a force for liberation actually uh, and for the common good, not just social division and corporate tyranny. Um, so we can't insulate working people from change, we know that, but we can shape it and we can influence it and we can make it a fair transition. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you to both Chris and Bath for those uh, interventions. I don't have anything quite so uh, organised to say, but um, I'll begin with uh, talking about one of the things that causes the fear of uh, automation at the moment, the, 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 the trigger for the current 
Wave of Panic was an article published back in 2013 by the economists uh, Fry and Osborne, who argued that between 2030 and uh, the following period, somewhere between uh, 30 and 70 percent of all jobs would disappear, depending on the sector. Now, we've already seen a fair few jobs, uh, uh, for example, in supermarkets disappear as the tills get automated. Uh, one thing we should add is that it's not only working class jobs that look like they're susceptible to disappearance. Google Translate is doing away with the skilled jobs of translators. One of the big fears is that we're going to see not just the end of the uh, working class uh, skilled professions that we saw in the 1980s, uh, mining, uh, shipbuilding, we are now seeing the elimination of what vocational middle class jobs remain too. Universities are increasingly adopting things like pre-recorded videos uh, for lectures. That means that you can do away with contractualized staff. Law cases uh, can be subdivided into a thousand minor tasks and sold off to mechanical Turks in India. What we mean by mechanical Turks is uh, it looks like there's a robot doing the, the work. Actually, in place of a robot, it tends to be lots of very poorly paid people uh, doing uh, micro units of, of, of real labor. Medicine, too, is being devocationalized. Accounting is being devocationalized, replaced by algorithms doing all the work. Even in places like the city, shares now change hands something like 12 times per second, far, far faster than any uh, trader can hope to keep on top of. It's no surprising, uh, unsurprising in that circumstance, that workers in the city are all coked out of their minds, uh, simply trying to keep up with the pressures of their work. The kinds of jobs that are predicted to remain after all this, these are jobs that we don't uh, want to be done by robots. Childcare uh, and teaching given standardly as one of those. And it's been speculated, well, maybe one of the upsides of automation here is that we'll suddenly see things like childcare redignified and given uh, the credit, the social dignity that they've deserved all along. It's difficult to imagine uh, how that will come to pass if you've got uh, so many people going after so few of those jobs. The big question is where the new jobs are going to come from. There's a really interesting set of statistics that comes from a book by Steve Keen, The Internet is Not the Answer. Steve Keen contrasts how at its uh, during its heyday between the 1970s and the 1990s, Kodak uh, employed about 200,000 people, give or take. An entire town uh, in the east, uh, eastern tip of America worked directly for Kodak or in associated industries making food for people who made camera film and so on and so forth. When Kodak closed down, Instagram was widely credited uh, with replacing the same functions that Kodak had done. Instagram, at its peak market value of about a billion uh, dollars, employed 51 people, not 200,000. Spotify replaced all the music services. Spotify, at a point, its point of market flotation, employed 13 people. Now, the big proposition that gets made is we will see new jobs come along. But where? The economist uh, Frey and Osborne, the ones who made this prediction of the disappearance of jobs, Frey subsequently backtracked slightly and has published a book since called The Technology Trap, where he says, well, actually, the big waves of unemployment that we expected to see in the 19th century didn't happen in quite the way that people imagined because they were already leaving miserable rural employment for jobs in the cities that paid better and did better. 
the jobs that were coming along by virtue of the Industrial Revolution were already visible on the horizon. That, I would contend, is no longer the case. We are living in a stagnant economy that is being kept afloat by a stock market bubble and by rising property uh, prices that mask the lack of industrial pro productivity. Uh, one of the big uh, impresarios, the head of innovation at Google, a philosopher called Ray Kurzweil, has predicted that we're very close to the point where the new jobs that are created will precisely not be performable by people. They will be the kind of high-level technical jobs that can only get done by robots, by nanobots in particular. There is already evidence that the kind of jobs that are being created nowadays are bad jobs, as Chris was saying earlier. We've got something like 1.5 million uh, jobs on zero-hour contracts. We've got 37% of all jobs. This is done in a study uh, published last year by the anthropologist David Graeber. 37% of jobs are what he calls bullshit jobs. That is a technical anthropological term to describe jobs deemed by the people who do them to be not necessary. In other words, people are in jobs, up to a third, over a third of people in jobs simply do not think those jobs need doing. They are done just to keep people busy. What does this mean? They are the kinds of work that afford no basis for social dignity. And that in an age where increasingly our dignity is bound up with our professional identity. One of the things that, has that automation has been shown to do in the, in the workplace, and this links back to Graeber's argument, automation, as it has been rolled out so far, does not replace work that doesn't need, need doing. On the contrary, it seems to create a lot of new work that precisely doesn't need doing. Think of all the kinds of compliance forms that people regularly end up filling out, forms of insurance, indemnification, uh, <clears throat> the kind of things that are produced but just by being part of a technological system in a workplace. The multiplication of emails to take up all hours of the working day. Now, this creation of jobs might not be a problem if the robots, when they come along, are working in our favour. Back about 100 years ago, I think writing in the 1920s, John Maynard Keynes, the economist, predicted that just as the working week had shortened from 18 to 12 hours a day, so by the time his grandchildren were alive, people would only be working for three days a week. That hasn't come to pass. What we've got instead is not robots taking the burden off us, but people being forced increasingly to compete with robots. This is the nature of the kind of work of the gig economy. If we can set up an organization of automating technologies such that they are working not against us, but with us, such that they are reducing uh, the burden on human labor, rather than forcing us to compete with robots, if we can achieve this kind of organization of uh, automated labor, that is something that certainly could work in our favor. But this brings us back to that standard question in Marx's thought, who owns the means of production? Is it the workers owning the robots? In other words, owning the technologies that mean that they reap the benefits of the work being done in their place? Or is it the privatized uh, mega companies like Amazon and Facebook who can use uh, robots to drive prices, uh, to drive wages ever lower? I have worked over the last few years, not in this country, but in one fairly close by. I have worked with companies 
who are financing community regeneration projects, projects because they know that they are preparing to make something like 30,000 redundancies. What's stopping them is that we are in a stagnant economy. While the economy is stagnant, it is cheaper to keep people on low wages than it is to fork out multi-millions of dollars or euros uh, buying new machinery. At the moment, automation is being stave off, staved off by the fact that we are grinding along in uh, a poorly performing economy. Things like Brexit become uh, more understandable uh, in this light. Why is it uh, that people in favour of Brexit uh, aren't more worried about the predicted loss of all of these fruit pickers and agricultural workers uh, that currently sustain our food supply. Well, if you go on YouTube, you will find all kinds of incredible new farming machines that can drive along without a driver, shake an olive tree until all the olives fall off, catch them in nets, and do away with workers. Those machines, incidentally, are also wiping out more or less the entire bird population of Greece because they suck up olives into giant hoovers in the middle of the night and in so doing also suck up the remaining birds. One of the reasons that there is so much enthusiasm in certain parts of the country for privatising the NHS is that uh, some of the people speculating about where economic growth will happen in the future predict that the privatisation of healthcare will constitute uh, what economists call the sixth Kondratiev cycle or the fifth industrial revolution. It's the prospect of flogging insurance, selling off uh, the nationalised health service that they see as one of the potential ways that we can start to create new jobs. But the key point here is it's still not clear where these jobs are coming from. That wouldn't necessarily be a problem if we were able to take uh, the money that is being saved by robotics, the time that is being saved by robotics, and giving back to the people who are currently doing the work. With the current organisation of society, that does not look like it's on the cards. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Alison. I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to follow those speeches, but uh, I'll try. Um, and especially that I uh, work in HR, which is everyone's least favourite profession, so uh, please be gentle with me. Um, uh, it's an absolute privilege to be talking in this beautiful building, so uh, thank you for asking me. And um, although I do come with a different perspective, um, given what I do, there is um, a lot of synergies in what's being said. You know, we're, we are, um, you know, we're saying a lot of the same things and, and just coming at it from different angles. And I think that's what, what's so nice about being here and having the debate and having everybody give their opinion and, and come from these different perspectives because it's, it's clearly uh, not an easy problem and uh, unless we take in everyone's view, we're not, gonna, we're not going to find a solution. So um, I'm a freelance strategic HR and organization development consultant. Um, I've worked in HR for 20 years and most of that's been in the manufacturing and engineering sectors. Um, I'm a chartered fellow of the CIPD um, and I've done in my employment a lot of STEM outreach stuff. I've worked with schools and, and um, school children to encourage them to take up STEM subjects. Um, and, I, and when I was, um, when I was employed, uh, I successfully collaborated with a number of training organizations to upskill existing, existing workers um, rather than as, the, as technology replaced uh, more administrative roles. Um, and had really successful apprenticeship schemes. So a lot of the, the although yes, I work in HR, a lot of the, the issues are, that are being discussed are, are really important to me as well. Um, I'm now mostly supporting smaller businesses um, and the best work that I do, the nicest work that I do is working with businesses that 
are growing and want to retain their good, positive cultures. Um, you know, tech sector businesses. Um, I work from Tusk Park, which is a, an entrepreneur hub in, in Newcastle, um, a co-working space. Um, and I, I'm involved in the tech sector, working there, being part of Digital Union, and, and I, I, for a long time, worked in Skills Group, uh, worked, um, been part of Skills Groups. I'm also a mum and a stepmum, and my children, this is affecting them as well. Um, I've got two autistic stepchildren, and, and um, I've got two beautiful children, and, and I don't even know what jobs they're going to do. Um, so all, all of these things are things that are kind of explain my perspective on, on this. Um, so the topic, a just transition. Well, it's a transition, it's a change, um, it's uncertainty. Um, the Brexit word I wasn't going to mention, but it's been mentioned a couple of times already. You know, we're there. That, you know, I am by character an optimist, um, and I'd like, I'd really like to think that um, as jobs are automated, they'll be replaced with better jobs. Um, but as Gerald was saying, you know, where, where are they coming from? You know, what are we going to do about it? And that's why it's so important to get everyone around the table and, and talk about this. That's why it's, it's such an important discussion. Um, I realise it's, it's, it's not as simple as just finding better jobs um, and it's a long-term problem and the pace, the pace of new technology as it's being introduced is phenomenal um, but the world of work's changing as well, um, the world's changing, work is really important, it's, um, it's your identity, it's who you are, it's, but it's also really important for your psychological health as well to have that routine and to, to be employed. Um, and it's also important to have quality jobs, you know, to have something meaningful. I think in terms of the skills, as has been said a couple of times already, we, we don't know what the skills are, we don't know what, what we need. But today, employers are still reporting skills gaps um, I, I was at a, an HR event last week and my HR colleagues tell me that they still are struggling to recruit trade skills and tech skills. Those are the two areas where my HR colleagues are really struggling to, to fill those, those jobs. And, and actually for both of those, STEM's essential, um, but because we don't know which jobs that the tech sector needs, it's quite hard to, to start embedding that in schools now because what, what are we going to teach our children? What, what do they need to learn? Um, and from a trade perspective, um, you know, I've, I've struggled for many years to, to recruit trade positions. Um, and one of the things that I've... I, a frustration of mine is that the, the apprenticeship framework is, is still... Is, 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 is quite hard to get into now. Um, you know, you still need to be quite academic to get an apprenticeship, and that, that hasn't always been the case. And I think the challenges that, that myself and my, my HR colleagues are facing, they're also, we're also trying to respond to the fact that employees want different things from work. They want work-life balance. They want meaningful work. People really want to be proud of what they do. They want to tell their friends that, you know, I, I work for this organisation and, and we do this in the community, or we do that and I've got this really interesting job and, and, and particularly some of the smaller businesses that I'm working with now, there is that real sense of pride and, and, and people are, you know, people, people own it and they feel part of it. Um, you know, and, and people want autonomy. So as, as, the, as well as technology changing, people's expectations are changing as well and from an employer's perspective, that's something we need to respond to. And in the region, from a regional employer's perspective, you know, we have the unique history and culture that's been described much more eloquently than I could. Um, but, you know, we also have one of the fastest growing tech sectors outside London. Um, there's, some been, there's been some really good collaborative work done um, with employer organizations such as Digital Union, the Chamber, Chamber of Commerce, um, I, was, I was at an event the other week um, on the North of Tyne Combined Authority Good Work Pledge. And that's all great, but as a region, we still have higher unemployment than the national average, and we still have a lower 
qualified um, population than the national average. And given that what everyone's talking about is that it's lowest, the, the lower skilled jobs that are at risk, what does that mean for our region? And it's a, it's, it's a real worry. You know, I, I know that um, zero hours contracts are un unpopular and they've been mentioned, but they can suit people so long as they're not used to exploit people. Um, I, I have an HR colleague who works in the social care sector, um, and, and he says that he, the agencies that he uses to fill um, to, the temporary jobs, they don't struggle to recruit, and they offer zero hours contracts, but he struggles to recruit for the, the same work and, and, and the same pay. And the other, the other thing to mention, I think, on the gig economy is that, you know, more than, um, more than fifth, I'm a gig worker, I'm self-employed, my partner is a gig worker, um, more than 50% of gig workers are, are creative IT or professionals. Um, and I'm a gig worker because I want the work-life balance for my family. I, I've explained to you my, my personal family uh, commitments and, I, and I, I need flexibility. And I think the reality of flexible working is that whatever it says on a piece of paper, I, it, it does need to be earned. And it would have been very difficult for me to replicate the flexibility that I'd earned in my previous job in a, in a new role. Um, and so our decision was for, for me to go freelance and become a gig worker. Um, and I've explained as well, I work out with an entrepreneur's hub. You know, that, that's entrepreneurship, I think, is a really, it's a good option. It's a good possibility for people as an alternative to employment. It's a good, um, it's something that should be supported. It's something that, um, that, that in, in all honesty, when I was on my own with my two kids, I couldn't have done it. I, I couldn't have gone freelance had I still been a single mum, because there isn't support for entrepreneurs. Um, and that's something that, as, as the world of work changes, I think we, we need to look at, we need to provide those opportunities. People want to work for themselves. They, you know, there's a lot of tech, tech businesses work out of um, my workspace. Um, and, you know, as a region, I, I mean, I've been overwhelmed by the, the startup community and, and the, the entrepreneur community in Newcastle. It's something I didn't know existed until I, I did it. But it's quite hard to, to get support and to have that support signposted. And it's, you know, it's, it's taken me nearly a year before I could pay myself a wage. And that's not something that is an option for everybody. Um, so, I, you know, I think that's something that needs exploring um, as, as jobs are automated. One of the other considerations, I think, you know, as legislation changes, there's, it, it's harder to employ people, and that's a lot of what my clients are finding. There's, there's a lot of consultation out on various, um, in, you know, improvements to, to workers' rights. Um, and I think... I, I would like to think, and I know that there's some terrible employers out there, but I would like to think that good employers do that stuff anyway. And I worry that increased legislation makes it harder to employ people, and then the market forces that Gerald was describing will dictate and will speed up the pace of, of jobs being replaced. If you take the apprentice levy as an example, this region saw a fall in the number of apprentices in the first two years of the apprentice levy, which was, which to be honest is shocking. We used to fly the, the flag for apprenticeships in this region, but it's now really difficult. And, it, and it's almost like the apprentice levy was something that was kind of seen as a really good idea, put in, and then employers were left to manage it. Um, another, one of my HR colleagues works in a business of about 500 people, so a big business, but not huge. She, she has one full-time person employed just to manage the apprentice levy and employing apprentices. And that's a salary, that's, you know, that's, that's a, a job that, that you know, sh she doesn't need to have, she shouldn't need to have, it shouldn't be so difficult because it shouldn't have to take employing one person to manage that. You know, if, if you look at the Taylor Review, who, um, who rec and he recommended fair and decent work, um, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think, you know, when we, if, despite our varying perspectives, the one thing that as a panel we violently agree with is that there should be good jobs and there should be fair jobs. Um, but my own perspective is that I don't think over-legislating is the, the solution. Um, I think the risk is that people will turn off being employers and they'll seek 
technological solutions rather than employing people instead. Um, you know, it hasn't worked for equal pay. I think next, next year's 50 years since the Equal Pay Act came in and we're still reporting a gender pay gap of 8.6%. That's shocking. You know, as, as a woman, I, I don't get paid the same as my male counterparts for equal work. Um, I was reading some research came out yesterday that, that women are, it was by the Government Equalities Commission, women are significantly less likely to get promoted after having a baby. Again, that's shocking. You know, that these are, these are things we need to, to address. But my concern is if the responsibility, like the apprentice levy, if the responsibility sits entirely with employers, then it, it will it'll be worse because market forces will dictate. And Gerald mentioned some of the unscrupulous employers, you know, the, the names of employers that we probably wouldn't want to work for. We don't want that to become the norm. Um, and we don't want a push to push technology to increase unemployment. Um, I think France has 8.6% um, unemployment versus the UK's 3.1. Um, and as a region, given what I mentioned about unemployment levels and, and qualification levels compared to the national average, my big, and, and what I said about apprentices, my big worry is that it will be the most vulnerable people in society that lose out. Um, and, I, and I'm really concerned that the gap between the haves and the have-nots will increase. Um, and that's why it's, it's, it's really important that we work together. Now, employers do have responsibilities. Of course, employers have responsibilities. And, and actually, given that employees are now demanding different things, the best employers, the ones that attract the best talent, are the ones that will be doing those things. The, the jobs that people will want, the places that people will want to go for, uh, places people want to work will be the ones that, that are the best employers and there's always going to be specific skills that are required. You know, my HR colleagues tell me that pay is still the number one thing that drives people to, that attracts people, but it's a culture that keeps people. Um, having a good positive working culture is why people stay and why people don't leave and how you, how you keep your skilled employees. So I think Employers have responsibility to be the type of employer that, that people want to work for. They have the responsibility to upskill their workforce, responsibility to have fair work and, and provide quality jobs. Smaller businesses, um, it, it can be harder, and that's what I'm seeing with my clients now. But there's nearly six million businesses in this country with fewer than 50 employees. And for those businesses, it's easier and it's cheaper to implement new technology because they're more agile um, and they find it hard to compete anyway because they don't have the brands and they don't have the resources. And again, I worry that for those smaller businesses, which, are, which collectively are huge employers, that they'll turn to techno technological solutions quicker than they might have done otherwise accelerating the pace of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, you know, the CIPD chain, um, released some uh, seven dimensions of work, of a job quality earlier this year. And they're paying benefits, contracts, so the things we were discussing, job design. And it's really important to design a job that allows someone to have fulfilled work. Work-life balance is also a really important factor and the relationships you have at work, because that's one of the things that is the most positive thing that you get from, a, from working, is the relationships you have with your colleagues. I, I, I work on my own now, but I, I choose to work in a co-working space, because I, so I, I've got some company. Um, and also people want voice and representation, they want to be heard, um, and health and well-being are really important. So that's what the HR profession are telling its members, that they should be focusing on. And I think that's really, really positive. Um, so so there, is, there is a movement to respond to what, employ, um, what employees are asking for. Um, it, it's just, it, it's taking a long time. So in summary, I think, you know, we all are universally agreed automation is coming. Um, and I think there's lots of issues here. Um, it's not like, it's not a, an easy problem. There's lots of opportunities as well, but like any problem, there isn't just one solution. There's not a silver bullet that's going to solve the whole thing, and that's why we're here having this discussion. 
And I think that's why organizations like the Common Room provide an opportunity for all of the stakeholders to get together and have a safe discussion in spite of their differing viewpoints. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. That's certainly a lot of food for thought. So um, we'll open it up to questions. Um, I'm going to start the first one because that's my privilege. Um, what do you think we should do at regional level to prepare for this? Because um, I think from what you've all said, so much is dependent on what central government does. But actually, this is a region that has in the past mobilised and changed things. So do you think there is something we could be doing regionally on this? Chris. I think, yeah, I think that was kind of the thrust of what I was saying as well. I talked about decentralising and democratising decision making, and that's about bringing power close to people. I mean, we're all sat in a room here, that's the epitome of bringing power close to local communities. So every, uh, every village, every lodge, as we call it, in this area, in, in Hope, where I live now, in Blackwall, where I grew up, there's a, there's a seat for every one of them. In fact, if someone's sitting on the Blackwall seat, I don't know which one it is, Ross? Do you know, know him? But you list. So if I was sitting on the blackboard seat, there was a token underneath that I paid for, uh, as, as many, many people uh, in, the, in the community have, and the decisions were made here, and they were made locally. All right, okay. Yeah, <laughs> Sherman Hill's got my dad on as well, because I bought his as well. Um, so I think, I think you know, this is, this is the thing. If, if you give people autonomy and control over their own decision-making, then people can decide how this works in their local community. I think decisions that are taken very remotely, um, decisions that maybe would work for London and don't work for the North East, um, or made by people who don't really understand how some local communities work, that isn't going to work. Something as profound as this requires local democracy and local decision making. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I think a couple of speakers were talking about, you know, where, where is this going to happen? So I think that one of the key things for me is identifying, well, working with industry to identify the sectors where this is going to be, you know, happening sooner. And one of the things we've been calling uh, on in terms of the development, whether it's local industrial strategy or government's industrial strategy, is sectoral collective bargaining. Um, so identifying the sectors, bringing unions, business, worker voice together, making sure that we do have worker representation, because actually, um, when it comes to transitioning to a net zero economy or managing... Uh, helping businesses manage through tough times when it comes to the recession. It, it has been uh, strong trade unionised workplaces that have managed to meet those challenges the most because actually they have worker voice around the table, they help them with the solutions. I think the key thing for me, what we could be looking at is just developing things like workplace technology agreements with unions, uh, learning accounts, um, learning agreements in workplaces to help workers transition. And actually, I think where we have workplaces that actually are um, benefiting financially in terms of profits from this, that they're sharing the proceeds of growth with their workers through offering, obviously, I'm going to say higher pay, but more flexible working. Because workers tell us they want the benefits of technology to let them have a better life. So the four-day working week is a popular, uh, it's not TC policy, but it's certainly popular when we talk to workers about, you know, what do you want from automation? What do you want from moving to a low carbon economy? Um, and it's flexible working and more time to have, you know, a good, a good life. And, and I think that holistic approach to worker well-being in the workplace is key to keeping them. And that means pay, terms and conditions, pensions, investment in health and well-being, reskilling, opportunity to develop. When we talk about inequality, um, and, I, and I do agree with what businesses are doing to get more women around boards, which is great, but actually it's not about quotas and numbers on company boards, it's about how do we support those in the middle and those at the bottom as well to progress. That's the issue. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've got lots of ideas, but I don't want to take up everything. Thanks, Beth. Does that, uh, just, Alison, does that reflect what you've been hearing from the private sector? It, it does, yeah, and I think also that the work that the um, combined North Tyne Authority doing on the Good Work Pledge for businesses to sign up to is really, uh, really good as well. I think the only problem with that is, I mean, I've, I've been part of the formation of the Good Work Pledge since 
it was an idea. In fact, it was created off the back of the TUC's great jobs agenda. Um, and it's great to see that seed grow um, to a good work pledge that businesses will have to sign up to. But it's key that it's not a sticker in your shop window, yeah. that it's actually through policy implementation. And that um, and every, there's lots of things in the good work pledge that are free, actually, and don't cost employers a lot of money. The problem I have with that in my job now is how do I take that to the rest of the North East, the four authorities that aren't part of the combined authority, how do I then take that to Teesside where potentially you know, we have a, a, a mayor who's not even interested about talking about the topic um, with me in particular. Um, so it is, I, I worry that we're going to have this pledge in the North of time, but actually what about everybody else? So that's the concern that I have. Although I'm very proud of the work yeah. we've achieved in getting the right people around the table, I'm worried about you know how we take that forward. And I think um, that was at the consultation um, I was at last week. That was one of the the problems that actually empl employers said, and they said actually, well, what do we sign up to? Because there are other things that you can sign up to, and and, and employers were asking for something that was that was wider reaching. That's exactly what employers yeah. are saying. Okay. So um, I can make. Two points about this. Um, all the answers given so far suppose that work is the solution here. It isn't necessarily. There are two things I think we can do at a regional level. One would be to campaign to run a trial for universal basic income up here. The second would be to uh, reconceive the function of the university socially. I'll explain both. So the idea of the universal basic income is that you don't need a benefit system. You can replace it by giving everybody, rich or poor, uh, a top-up of something like 12000 a year. So you replace the benefit system with a universal income for everybody. You incentivize the uh, people with money to give it away, invest it in charity, so on and so forth. Uh, for people at the bottom end of the earning scale, one, you mean you, you create a circumstance in which people forced to do badly paid jobs because they're desperate aren't that desperate anymore. You increase the value of nurses, of delivery workers, because people no longer have the choice between doing that job or having no job at all. So one thing that UBI would do is mean that, work, uh, that delivery drivers, uh, nurses have the option of doing something else, of not working at all, and that forces uh, the employers to start paying them more appropriately for the work that they do do. Alternatively, they have the option of not working. They can spend their time doing things that they find fulfilling, be that gardening, be that making hats to sell uh, over the internet, starting small businesses that way. You get a little bit of a cushion to start investing in developing yourself a life. The function of work is twofold. One, it's to provide an income. Two, it's to provide a basis for identity. We can take care of income through other means. We don't need to be paying people to do jobs that don't need doing when we've already got work that doesn't need doing, driving people to mental health problems, driving us to the overconsumption that is causing uh, the problems of uh, environmental breakdown. And there are other ways that we can create bases of identity. Free people up to do the things, to pursue the hobbies that they want to pursue. The function of the university becomes significant in this respect. Durham has already lost one basis for industry. Now the town is hopelessly over-dependent on a university. And we're going to be even more screwed than we currently are if... 10, 15, 20 years from now, degrees aren't worth anything because there are no solidly middle-class jobs for Durham's middle-class students to get. So, the dissipation of the vocational professions, the loss of middle-class work, constitutes a fundamental threat to the existential function of the university, currently conceived as it is, for supplying the labour market with workers. But that doesn't need to be the function of the university. I'm involved in a project that reconceives the function of the university as a community hub 
that gets people involved in doing the kinds of dignifying, meaningful work that they want to do. We start to see little glimpses of this uh, in ideas like citizen science, where you get local people involved in environmental research projects, things that actively contribute something of value to the life of their communities. The university can become uh, a hub for organizing people to participate, be it in archaeological digs, or to develop new forms of knowledge about the local environments in which they live, be that the built environments or the natural environments surrounding them. Projects like this can become the basis of giving people meaningful, dignified work that gives their life value that they're not currently finding in employment. We already see the success of this. Uh, you have various projects in the United States. They're not particularly good examples, but they take us some way there already. Uh, there is a project called Galaxy Zoo, where when you're not working your night shift in McDonald's, you can be downloading data from NASA satellites, helping NASA scientists identify what's out there in the solar system. You can be uh, whiling away your night shift on a petrol station, uh, playing with scientific experiments that will help scientists understand how protein gets folded into DNA. Those aren't particularly good examples of it because they're fairly low-level gamified apps, but there are all kinds of uh, research tasks that people can be doing that will lend value to their communities when they're currently feeling like they're contributing nothing. So, UBI and uh, involving people in, in, in the work that actually needs doing, but which isn't currently being done because it's not adequately rewarded by the market. Thank you. Fascinating. Final thank you to our panellists.